What makes life in the Nature Coast so special is just the natural beauty of this place. It's, it's more Florida than the rest of Florida in my eyes. So the reason I care so much about seagrass is it drives the economy that I'm a part of. And I mean, to be honest with you, it's beautiful out there. I love seeing the fish. I love seeing the environment. It, it makes the fishing here very, very good. So I'm very concerned with the state of the seagrass in the entire state of Florida. Seeing the rest of Florida having issues with seagrass is terrifying because I'm scared that one day that's gonna happen here. We need to find a way to fix the rest of Florida and we need to find a way to preserve this part of Florida and prevent it from getting to that point. I get a tremendous amount of joy out of taking people that have never seen this area out on the water. It, you know, fishing's fishing. It's great when we catch a ton of fish and have a great day, but from the second we get out there, they're in awe before they even see their first fish, just because the natural beauty of this place is unlike anywhere in the world. The three big tourist seasons are scallop season, which we're in the middle of right now, manatee season in the wintertime, and then fishing kind of trickles in all year as far as tourism is concerned. All of those are dependent on seagrass. Well, seagrasses are, are flowering plants that occur in marine ecosystems. Much like their, their freshwater cohorts, um, we think of like eelgrass or tape grass in, in freshwater ecosystems. And in Florida, we see them in the springs and rivers. Even though there are some subtle differences between seagrasses and their freshwater counterparts, they really function the same way ecologically. Seagrass has been around in Florida for a long time. Florida emerged from the sea about 35 million years ago. We think the time frame of seagrass is about the same in Florida. And these plants basically create a carpet much like your, your yard, you know, the, the grass in your yard. They're all thick, dense mats of grass, and they provide a lot of habitat and other ecosystem services. For an area the size of a, of a football field of seagrass, that ecosystem could support tens of thousands of fish and, and likely millions of invertebrates. So we think about seagrasses as having tremendous economic impact on, on our coastal communities, and, and, and for several reasons. One, of course, there's a lot of jobs associated with um, commercial fishing and guide fishing, um, but also just the industry of sport fishing brings tourism to our coastal communities. And, and those seagrasses are an integral part of that. And the economic impact from losing them is substantial in the billions of dollars per year in lost tourism revenue. We are known in Crystal River as the home of the manatees. We have so many manatees here because we have lots of springs with warm water refuge. We have lots and lots of seagrass now all the way out to the end of the river. It's a very safe environment. Um, the water's so clear now that you can see the manatees in the water and you don't have to worry about hitting them with your boat, a boat strike. Um, people can come right up next to them in a kayak and they just lift their noses up and smile at you. and. Um, people have seen lots of babies born behind their homes because it's such a, a refuge that the manatees are loved by everybody and, and they feel safe here. My favorite part is to watch a little kid the very first time they see a manatee and they're in the water. This just happened last year. Got in the water and she's swimming along. She was about four years old. She's looking and she saw one and she just came straight up out of the water and screaming, Daddy, I see one! You know, she was so excited and she's waving everybody over. She'll never forget it. She will love manatees forever because of that experience. And that's what swimming with the manatees gives to people is they fall in love and they never get over it. You have to have seagrass in order to have a healthy economy, a healthy community, um, healthy water to drink. You don't want to swim in dirty water that smells and you can't see in it. You want that nice clean water like you see out there now. It's clean, it's clear, it's beautiful. If we lose the seagrass in the state of Florida, it's not just the manatees that will suffer. Everything will suffer.
Back when I was a kid, the seagrass was so thick here, the water was crystal clear. They call it gin clear. And it was like the keys, miles of seagrass, absolutely miles. There was so many fish, any little hole, any little, any little depression in the sand out there, you would find your, your predator fish that you were targeting out there. And if it was not the predator fish you're out there looking for, you're not fishing when you were a kid back then, the wildlife, the manatees, the, the, the dolphins you would see. We would get excited seeing manatees. You know, as far as the timeline of the Indian River dying, I've seen it firsthand. First, we lost our water flow, then we lost our oysters, and then we had a huge population bloom. We lost our clams after that. And when we lost our clams, we had a freeze in 2011. All the nutrients blacked out the water. We lost our seagrass, and you got what we got today. It looks like, you know, Space Coast has definitely got the name right here because it looks like a moonscape out on our flats now. There has been a major decline of seagrass here in the Indian River Lagoon due to a decline in water quality, and that has been attributed to an increase in nutrients. Studies have found that the leading cause of these nutrients is sewage from septic tanks, with fertilizers and stormwater runoff also playing an important role. In the Indian River Lagoon, we have actually seen a 58% decrease in seagrass habitat just since 2009. In the state of Florida, we've seen about a 50% decline in all of our seagrass in the last 50 years. There were so many jobs lost along the Indian River Lagoon system. There were thousands of people out here, clammers, oyster dredgers, fishing guides, bars along the river. The boats aren't out there because of the, you have red tide and the river now people start, you know, breathing in this stuff and you get warnings, don't go out on the river, don't breathe the, the air from the river. Nobody wants to go out and see manatee swim by the boat with a rib sticking out or a dead manatee floating by your boat or a dead porpoise floating by because of water pollution. It's something that we could have fixed a long time ago, but we sat on our hands too long and we got what we got now. Seagrasses are very important to manatees because this is their food source. Manatees can consume approximately 100 pounds of seagrass a day. And so unfortunately, when we start to lose seagrass, we start to see manatees become sick and starve. So the, the manatee die off in this last 18 months has been unprecedented. In Florida, we've lost almost 2,000 manatees. So that's approximately a quarter of the population statewide. This unprecedented die-off of manatees really gets to the heart of, of the problem that we have here. Losing one of those iconic pieces of, of, of where we live is, is like losing a bit of yourself. And I think a lot of people will identify with that. That is a representation of, of what we do and what we strive to protect. And having this massive die-off has been, been nothing short of catastrophic, not only for the environment, but for, for us as Floridians too. So there's a, there's a fine line to walk with, with seagrass restoration. And, and it requires those elements, not only the, the propagation of the plants and the available opportunities and funding to put them in place, but also to ensure the water quality will sustain them. And there has been success. We've seen success in seagrass restoration projects around the state, but it requires more than just those of us planting and restoring seagrasses. It's gotta be a groundswell movement. Because the decline of seagrass is relatable to water quality, we really need to take a step back and fix the problem at hand first. There's a lot of restoration that can be done, but the restoration really needs to better understand how to restore an impaired water quality or allow us to fix infrastructure to allow restoration to take place properly. There were quite a few uh, water quality issues that were facing Crystal River. Um, we had uh, large algae blooms, and eventually we lost all of our SAV. When Crystal River really realized that there was a problem with water quality, uh, a lot of the community got together. They took um, just samples of muck and algae up to Tallahassee. They put it on um, the desks of all the people that matter and um, they really wanted to fix the problem. So that's when Sea and Shoreline joined Save Crystal River in the effort. And we have, we started by removing all of the detritus, the muck from the bottom and planting SAV, native SAVs like eograss in Crystal River and allowing it to flourish and really clean up the water. And the city itself um, really went back to, to restructuring their septic to sewer program, getting everybody off of any leaking septics um, and onto city sewers. Um, to help really improve the water quality along with the plants. 
It's one of those things that we're very proud that we have finally accomplished. We have hit that tipping point to where we have now an SAV, a plant-dominated uh, system versus an algae-dominated system. Uh, but it was it was a lot of little things that led to that tipping point. Thanks to the community's help, thanks to the city's help. There's a few things out there that can be done in the immediate future that are going to make drastic changes, such as septic to sewer, such as getting educated on how to fertilize your grass, when to fertilize your grass. Education is the key. I think we can recover from our mistakes as we learn. As a scientist, sometimes the work we do is, is um, kind of wears on you as you see a lot of decline. But the real benefit of the kind of work we're doing here is that we get to work with amazing people. There's scientists, there's activists, there's um, environmental folks from every different walk of life engaged in this process. And that really makes me feel like I'm a part of something big and that we have a, we have a true shot at success. I'm very hopeful for the future of aquatic seagrasses in the state of Florida because I think the awareness has been raised. I'm a native Floridian, so I know what it used to be. A lot of people do, but there's a lot of people that are new to the state. And they have to understand that you're not guaranteed this beautiful, clean water anywhere in the state. You have to work for it. You have to get involved. You have to talk to your legislators when they come to town and say, water is important to us. Whether you're new to Florida or whether you've been here for generations, either way, you've got to have clean water, you've got to have seagrass, or you're not going to have anything. You owe it as your own legacy to future generations to please keep the water clean. Protect the seagrass because that's the basis of the food chain.